Good evening, and welcome to the season finale of Coffee with Keith. It's been 13 wonderful episodes, or 12 so far, and tonight we'll make 13. My name is Amy Gruber, and I'm the Director of Enrollment Management at TASIS Portugal. Uh, and as always, it is my pleasure to open this webinar. I'd like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions, which I will ask our uh, wonderful teachers and headmaster at the end of the webinar. So please feel free to submit those questions using the, uh, the feature with the question mark on the, uh, the webinar portal here. So without further ado, I will send it over to our headmaster, Keith Chiquin. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, Andrea. Welcome to the final episode, the 13th, lucky 13th episode. So much caffeine consumed over the last three plus months. Um, you know why the number 13 is considered unlucky, by the way? It is a superstition based on the 13 attendees of the Last Supper. Apparently, that last chapter didn't behave very well. Uh, personally, though, I think it's because it's the year when young people become teenagers. And let's face it, that is an unlucky time to be a parent. Either way, I did promise Jonathan's parents that we would consider adding another update of Coffee with Keith in July. I'm not making a commitment yet, but we may have some things to share. So we'll let you know about that. But certainly we won't be back for a few weeks. We've got a bunch of construction to take care of first. Uh, but I will admit to being very pleasantly surprised by the enthusiasm for these webinars. Parents have told us that they look forward to this event every week. And to those parents, really, you need to find more interesting hobbies. Uh, one parent, though, recently commented that the webinar seems so professionally produced, which I laughed at because uh, I can assure you this is a very small team producing these events. Uh, in fact, there are just the three of us. Um, but I do want to thank Andrea Balaz, our director of studies, who's our technical producer. And of course, as you've heard me comment, her daughter Alma actually does most of the work. And Amy Gruber, our director of marketing and enrollment management, who has been vetting the questions, making sure that none of Franz's get through. And of course, our wonderful faculty who have supported us and joined in. For those of you who haven't had your 15 minutes of fame, I apologize, but everyone will meet you in person in 10 short weeks. I did have a good laugh, though, at a most recent comment. Actually, it was from last week when we announced this would be our last one. And I, I made a joke to one of our parents who's in Germany, uh, who shall remain nameless, although he goes by the pen name Bruno. And he, I said to him, you would have to consider taking your wife out on a real date after this ends on Thursday. And he wrote back and said that he had a plan to watch the first 13 episodes again on future Thursdays just to avoid that. So Bruno, we're looking forward to having you here with us at TASIS and your poor wife, Ellen, and of course the boys, Noah and Oliver. Noah is probably watching tonight because he wanted to meet his third grade teachers who unfortunately could not be with us. I will address that shortly. However, a few updates. We'll start with the bad news. And it's been a while since we've had bad news, but we have a bit this week. We had our first case in some COVID-19 among the construction crew, and we have been forced to shut down for the last three days. Today, we had workers, mostly specialty workers, putting up the gypsum board on the classrooms and the final plywood that goes on before we apply our facades to the exterior of the building. But we have lost a few days. So that's um, troubling to us. We don't have a lot of time to, to waste. With that said, we have applied to work on weekends, and we believe that will be granted in a couple of time. So uh, I've said this before, I'll say it again tonight. We have two backup plans, which we uh, checked with the Ministry of Education just yesterday. We had a meeting with them to show them our facility because we made some changes to the facility and they've been the, the architect, the chief architect has been exceptional in helping us. But uh, plan one is to take advantage of an offsite building, which is only a few minutes away by car. That has been checked by the ministry and they will approve that. And also, if we had to, we could place portable classrooms anywhere on the site, including on our field. Neither is an attractive option, however. 
but they are approved and you'll use them as a fallback. The ministry has a good opinion. They say just get people working harder and make sure you're open in September. So, um, and that's our plan. Other good news though, our playground has been approved along with the early learning center up for a classroom design along with our playing field decision. We decided recently, just this week, to instead of attempting to grow natural grass on the entire field, which based on the growing season might be troublesome, uh, we, we believe instead we're going to lay an artificial turf, which will be done much, much faster and then surrounded by grass on the perimeter. Um, and I will say to uh, Henrik, who might be listening from the Azores, I think he's there vacationing. Henrik, I know you prefer natural grass for rugby, but we are worried about the growing season and all the rainy weather in the fall. So you and I can chat about that sometime soon. Uh, as well, the, we confirmed that the indoor gymnasium and climbing wall will be installed in August. So that's good news. And uh, in general, all the facilities are coming together nicely with the exception of the construction crew's temporary slowdown. Anyway, if you read the Founding Families newsletter, and shame on you if you don't, you will have seen a young Lexi rocking her new Passus t-shirt. As well, we have three more suggestions for school mascot. Tassus unicorns, which I happen to like. Uh, also the Tassus storm, apparently named after a family's fish. And not just any fish, but a giant gourami, which the family is willing to donate, they claim, to Tassus. Although a very generous offer, I don't think Storm would feed the entire school. And finally, perhaps the funniest of the lot, Mateusz and Luisa have offered Harry the dog as a mascot. And I think everyone would love to see Harry roaming the corridors of Tassus. So I'll give that some thought. All right, let's meet some of these wonderful teachers. I continually boast about. We have two grade one teachers with us this evening, and I know some parents were concerned that Heather and Aaron, who we introduced months ago, uh, maybe weren't coming, maybe they had backed out. Why did we have two new grade one teachers? Well, we found better teachers, and we, no, I'm kidding. We have two classes of grade one, demand has been so significant, and therefore, uh, I'm going to introduce our other teaching pair this evening, starting with Carrie Chapman. Hi. Carrie Chapman joins Tassis from the International Preparatory School, where she has been teaching for the last three years. Carrie studied English at the University of Bristol before going on to complete a postgraduate certificate in education in London. Carrie has taught in the UK, the U US, and Africa. He's an outdoors enthusiast, a horseback riding instructor, a yoga teacher. Yes, a yogi. A rock climber and a dog lover. Naomi France joins Tassis from United World College to Phuket. Hello. She's in Thailand, where she has been a grade one teacher and a lower primary learning leader for three years. Naomi completed her law degree at Reading University before completing excuse me, her postgraduate certificate in education at the University of Plymouth. By the way, Reading University is so named, I believe, because it's a requirement for entry. And Naomi's parents had unfortunately neglected to tell her that the world has enough lawyers. <laughs> joining us, she began her career in her home country of Wales afterward Naomi as I said, in Africa, before moving to Thailand, she too practices yoga, paddleboarding, hiking, and camping. And I believe Naomi is our fourth or our fifth Welsh teacher. And I am now getting excited about the prospect of a South African Welsh staff women's rugby match. <laughs> By the way, interesting facts there are four times as many sheep as there are people in Wales. And it is the home of the famous author, Roald Dahl, who you've all heard of, and to Catherine and Zeta Jones, who, who come to think of it, Naomi bears a striking resemblance. And of course, well, national treasure, Tom Jones. But right then, I'm going to also introduce the two teachers who couldn't be here tonight. Sam Mason has lived in Portugal for four years. He spent the first two years teaching English language uh, sorry, teaching at the English Language Center in Kishkash. 
And for the past two years, he has taught at another school in such guys as a lower elementary and PE teacher. Prior to arriving in Portugal, he taught in Spain, Sam graduated from the University of Essex, did a degree in sports science, and then earned his TEFL and Montessori teaching qualifications. In his free time, Sam can usually be found surfing or on the golf course. And Sam was very disappointed to find out that when he joins the TAF, he won't have any free time. Oh, my technical director is uh, suggesting he's got an issue. No. All right, I got it. Thank you, Manuel. Okay. Sorry about that. We're having some technical issues. Uh, anyway, back to, by the way, England, Sam's birthplace, is famous for its big plot that has its own name. I believe that's called anthropomorphization, written to seven syllable words, and also some of the best, world's best curry, and currently is the leader in the European race for herd immunity. Oh, oh, and England did also produce a half-decent playwright and a few solid rock dancers. Sam's teaching partner in grade three will be Carla Slater. Carla has an undergraduate degree in graphic design and media and applies her creative background to her teaching. She believes creativity is the foundation of innovation and problem solving. Originally from South Africa, Carla taught in her homeland for many years before moving to Valencia, Spain, where she was the lead teacher in their upper, upper elementary class and early years coordinator. Most recently, Carla has spent the past years teaching elementary school and art at a school in Kashkaj, which I shall not name. Carla and her daughter Lexi will join us in August. By the way, South Africa is best known for its somewhat decent rugby side, who apparently won some sort of tournament, I believe, recently, uh, and as well its beautiful beaches where you can swim with the sharks. Moving on. Is it the sound? That's the phone? The visual? Yeah, it's touching. Okay, sorry. All right, we're, we're, we're trying to fix our sound issues here. So, although I've introduced them, they're not our guests this evening. Neither Carla nor Sam joined us this evening. Um, you know, we are here as a new school in Portugal to improve the quality of the educational landscape, to add to it. We're not here to make enemies. However, there seems to be some concern about our arrival in the market. And you know, when someone posts something on Twitter or Facebook that you find offensive and it doesn't really deserve a response, well, this is one of those times for me personally, and I'm only speaking for myself. You see, Sam and Carl were both informed by their current school that they would be fired if they appeared on this broadcast tonight. Even though they both resigned from their positions, and all the students have gone home for the summer. So we have honored that commitment that they've made to their employer. But I must admit, um, I was surprised. Coming to North America, this is not standard practice. In fact, I've been at 10 schools. That means Eight or nine previous times, my supervisor, my employer, my school promoted me to the next school. And that is really important in my opinion. Because if a teacher who's joined this noble craft, noble trade, uh, wants to improve their position in life, earn a higher wage potentially, or teach at another school, they should be supported by their school administrators and honored for the contributions they've made to the school in their time. Even if they're moving to a school just down the road, because that is the ethical thing to do. Teachers have not chosen this career path to become wealthy, but instead to help young people and to uphold community and moral standards, and themselves to be held as role models. We school administrators need to hold ourselves and our schools to that same level of responsibility. That is my opinion. I'm going to move on now. If, however, you have questions or comments for Carla or Sam, feel free to email them to me and I'll pass them along. All right, let's focus on the two wonderful teachers who are in front of us tonight. They are spectacular. I'm going to do as I always do, 
ask them a few questions, and then we'll look at the floor for your questions. So the first question, which is the question I think I've asked every one of our guests, why Portugal? Why Tassos? And what excites you about coming to this school? And we can start with, this. by the way, uh, Naomi is joining us from Thailand, as I said, and it's, I think, 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning for her. So if she's still awake after my long-winded diatribe, then congratulations. But we'll, we'll let her off the hook. We'll start with Carrie Chow. Carrie? <laughs> Um, thanks. So, uh, yeah, why Portugal? Well, um, I've been based in Portugal for three years now, and what initially attracted me to Portugal was um, the great outdoors life that you can have here. You have the mountains, the citra, those beautiful, beautiful forests, there's a gorgeous coastline, there's so much to do outdoors. And then if you want to explore the city, you have the Lisbon, which is a gorgeous place, so full of culture and those beautiful little cobbled streets and amazing views. Um, and the town of Sintra too, close by to where Tatis is obviously based. Um, so it's a beautiful, beautiful place to be. I think uh, the people are very friendly, um, really interesting culture, lots and lots of history. And I, I like the fact that it's a small, country. It feels like it's a really, really nice small community and um, and I'm just really enjoying living here and keep stay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, I'm really keen to stay in Portugal um, and so I definitely wanted to make the most of the opportunity to join the team at TASIS. Um, there's a real buzz in the international community about this new school that's opening up. Um, I'm familiar with the area of Ballora, having driven past it on my way from my home going to Sintra and hearing whispers about what was happening to this shopping centre, which I was familiar with the place, this huge campus and these grand plans that there's going to be a school that was opening up there, um, just sounded really, really exciting. And so I was intrigued to, to find out more about the plans for the school. And on delving a little bit deeper, I learned more about the curriculum, um, that the children would be following a wonderful, holistic, curriculum and they'll be doing yoga which I'm very interested in, um, chess and violin and also that the teachers would have an opportunity to work together as a team and that there would be team teaching involved too so I just found that really, really interesting and I was really keen to learn more and then when I spoke with you Keith when we had our first conversation I was just immediately struck by how positive and how supportive you were um, I thought these plans seemed really, really ambitious uh, for the new school, but also really realistic. I, I felt motivated and I really felt like I wanted to be part of this great plan. And um, yeah, I have to say, speaking to my new colleagues now, whenever I come away from conversations with them, I leave feeling that same sense of, uh, of excitement and motivation. So yeah, I'm really glad to be on board. Thank you, Carrie. Brilliant answer. Very comprehensive. Naomi? Hi. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so, why Portugal? Well, my first um, experience of international teaching, it was initially going to just be a couple of years. Um, I had a job in Nairobi. And I think at the time, I just intended that I would probably go back to the UK after that and maybe resume, <laughs> resume whatever I was doing then. And those two years and they've become like seven years um, abroad. So four in Kenya and three now in Phuket in Thailand, where I currently live. And we, me and my partner, Guillaume, we wanted to move back to Europe and be closer to family and friends. Like my family's in the UK and his is in France. Um, the last two summers, I've been really fortunate to holiday in Portugal, actually with my friend Carrie, and explore the coasts ourselves. We've hired camper vans, we've gone camping and walking, and, and I just really enjoy living by the sea. And it just feels like this perfect balance, this interesting, different culture, but we all get to be on the same time zone as our loved ones, and, and I get to um, be with my friend as well. So once Portugal was kind of the aim. Then I started researching schools and 
quite quickly I came across this brand new school that's being built and um, I was very interested in that in itself and it just looked so beautiful like the school when I went on the website I think what stood out to me the most was just how clear the what TASOS stands for and what the school is all about um, I found like so much information on there and I felt like it was so open and I really could get behind what um, they were saying the Pedagogy is based on research and there's a clear value of teachers and their contribution in the school. I felt like there is like academic rigor, but then balance with the skills as well as the knowledge and the development of the whole child. And um, like Carrie was saying about the yoga and interests of mine and violin and chess. It's really interesting curriculum. Um, so I finally did get to speak with Keith. And I really enjoyed our conversation and I felt that he, again, embodied that same clear vision that I'd already um, encountered and was, had so much enthusiasm for the school and um, for this project. So it got me super excited and I and my interactions with everyone, like Carrie said, has been super positive since. And um, yeah, so I'm super, very excited to <laughs> be able to come to Portugal and join TASIS. Fantastic answer. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, interestingly, you, the two of you met in Nairobi, worked together, and then applied, I believe you applied independently, because you were not connected in any way when I interviewed, certainly when I interviewed Carrie. And then I, I can't recall if Carrie actually, uh, I think Carrie might have recommended you, but it was, a, it was a, uh, a brilliant way for both of you to come together. I'm delighted that you could be this fabulous teaching team again. If my sound is breaking up, my apologies. I don't know what's going on with my computer, but uh, we'll soldier through. Okay, moving on. Next question. If I were to visit your classroom, and now I mean, we're going to start with you. If I were to visit your classroom, what would I see happening on any given day? Um. Okay, so I think if you when you come into the classroom, um, I think it would be very clear um, what is valued there. You're going to see the students are going to be engaged in whatever they're doing and very active in their learning. There's going to be challenge, enthusiasm and joy, hopefully. <laughs> um, depending on the activity or the time of day that you're going, coming into the classroom, um, you're going to see them potentially doing different things like there's going to be some freedom and choice in how they express themselves and demonstrate their understanding of what we're learning and there's going to be a blend of individual small uh, group work and large group work um, you'll hear lots of purposeful talk and questioning like between the students and we me and Carrie will be amongst the students working with them in those small groups or observing or having like one-to-one -one, um, sessions with them, supporting them as we feel necessary. Um, you will notice that the classroom environment, there's gonna be spaces like designated for different types of learning. So maybe quiet, independent spaces, spaces for reading, um, and then other areas maybe supporting thoughtful interactions and collaboration. On the walls, um, students thinking is going to be made visible and we're going to be displaying like the process of their thinking and the development of their ideas and not just finished products. And I believe that the students will have a lot of ownership over that classroom. If you come in and talk to them about it, they're going to want to show you around. They're going to be able to interact. This is their space. And I think it's going to be really reflective of that. Um, it should be a very warm and inviting environment for anyone who comes to visit. So, and you hopefully want to come in and explore and feel very welcome. Brilliant. Thank you, Naomi. Now, I'm going to ask Carrie the same question, but it's a tough question because you're both going to be in the same classroom. So, Carrie answers the question entirely differently than you. That We're going to have some conflict messages. <laughs> Go ahead, Carrie. 
Well, yeah, hopefully not. I think Naomi and I are actually really on the same page with our teaching and learning. And I think that's why we're really excited to work together as a team, because I think we know that we'll complement each other in our in our teaching styles. So, um, yeah, I would hope that it would be a really, really fun and welcoming sort of atmosphere that would first hit you as you walked into the room. Um, a first grade classroom is going to be a really dynamic space. There's going to be lots and lots of energy in there. Um, and it's going to vary from time to time according to the time of day and what kind of activities are going on. So perhaps there might be um, some whole group activities and then there would be a lot of energy, a lot of movement, a lot of noise. Maybe we're playing games all together or we're learning all together as a group, learning songs or rhymes. So there would be that kind of an atmosphere with a very high energy level at some points in the day. And then there'll be other moments when children are a little bit quieter, when they're working together in groups and they're collaborating on activities, um, talking through the learning that has already taken place and then extending their learning by sharing their ideas with one another. And then there'll also be moments for, for quiet reflection too. It's really important that we organise the day for children so that they don't burn out. They're very, very enthusiastic and that's great. But we need to make sure that we also offer their children moments of, of quiet, uh, where they can reflect, maybe they're reading, maybe they're doing a little creative, independent activities. They have time to be calm too. So I think the way that the classroom would look at different points in the day would be quite different. It would be, is the dynamic space that's going to change according to what's going on. Um, the thing that would be the common thread would be that children would feel a sense of purpose. They know what they're doing and they know why they are learning what they're doing. We're encouraging children to feel a sense of ownership over their work at this point. We're really, really trying to help them to become independent learners. So I would hope that children would be really, really enthusiastic to share their learning with you, that they would feel really proud of this classroom environment that was, that was theirs and that they would really be excited about showing you around, explaining where they keep everything, explaining all of the displays, showing off their work and explaining to you all about the learning that they're that they're doing too. Terry, that was fantastic. Thank you. And I think after four months at home with their parents as teachers, you're going to have so many independent learners in your class. It's going to be wonderful. Now, I just did want to check one thing out, and I think it might be your strong accent, but did you say you would hit the students as they entered the room? <laughs> did I, just, uh, I would, would welcome the students into the room. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to the next question. I don't want you to answer that, please. Um, the next question, what are the important academic and social emotional milestones for your students? And these are going to be six-year-olds, obviously. And uh, I don't know who wants to go first. You look like you're ready. Please carry on. I'll start off with this one. Um, so yeah, it's a huge year, grade one. Um, the children change so much and they develop so much over the course of that year. It's a really, really special moment in their learning. Um, I think the most important thing for me above all else that children leave grade one feeling is, um, is that they have a really deep love of learning, that they feel enthusiastic and that they feel that they can be successful learners. So we really need to set them up to see themselves as successful learners uh, by making sure that we give them tasks that are manageable. So feeding off their ambitions and their grand plans, their hopes and aspirations that children feel at this age and really encouraging that sense of excitement and offering a real can do a positive approach um, to learning in the classroom. Children at this age are also very adventurous. They want to challenge themselves. They want to take risks. And this is something that we also want to encourage them to do. Uh, it's our role to harness that intense desire that children feel at this point to, um, to explore their capabilities and to find out what they can do as learners as they develop and as they grow and as they become capable of new things. Um, Children ask lots of thoughtful questions at this point, questions about everything and anything. They have a voracious appetite for more knowledge and it's our job to really encourage that, 
encouraging the children to investigate their ideas about things, taking their questions seriously and showing that we really value their input in their learning and uh, again encouraging that sense of ownership over their own learning. Um, we want to nurture an enjoyment of reading and writing and exploring language so it's going to be a very, very um, literature rich environment where children feel that they can play and tell stories and explore um, and um, be adventurous in the language choices that they're making and really have fun and play and learn without worrying about getting anything wrong. So a really lovely, safe kind of space. Um, when we're talking about the milestones for, for grade one, I do think it's quite important that we don't get too caught up on what children should or shouldn't be doing at this point. I think it's really important to remember that um, children are very, very sensitive at this age. And if their parents or the adults around them are feeling anxiety about whether they have or haven't reached a particular milestone, that can actually feed into the way that the child is feeling and that can have a detrimental impact on their learning. So we really wanna keep it really, really positive. Of course, all of the children are going to be making progress, but I think it's really important to remember that each individual child is progressing at their own rate and in their own way. So each child's development is as individual as the child themselves. And having worked with children from a range of, range of different backgrounds, a range of different ages, I can really confidently say that progress isn't linear. Children will be progressing at different rates at different points. So we just need to support them where they are and build their confidence, put everything in place so that they can um, just retain that love of learning and keep seeing themselves as successful learners. Amazing answer, Carrie. I couldn't have said it better myself. In fact, I couldn't have come close to saying it near as well. So thank you. Naomi? Do you want me to read the question again, or are you, or are you good with it? Oh, you might be muted. Thank you. Yes, um, I totally agree with what you're saying as well, Carrie, about the progress and not being linear. And I think um, it can you have to be careful not to get too um, bogged down, like with um, milestones, particularly. Um, it really is completely normal for there to be a wide range of abilities within the classroom. And there's going to be times of like obvious growth. And then there's going to be times where it seems that maybe they plateau in some areas, but there's going to be, it's going to be constantly changing. And I think what's important is again, that their confidence is up and they know what they're working on. They know their next steps and that communication as well with parents, like we're going to have an open dialogue with you and talking about your child's progress like, as we're going along. Um, if I was going to say milestones, I guess literacy is a huge one at this age and they tend to, in grade one, um, develop their reading quite a lot. Um, mostly what I enjoy about this and that probably the best part of grade one is seeing that growth in reading and then seeing themselves as readers. You, I just finished with grade one class last week, actually. We just finished for the year. And it is quite phenomenal when you see the progress that they can make. And they they bridge a bit from just learning to read, but also reading to learn. And it's so empowering for them when they can turn to books independently to satisfy their curiosities and to explore what they're interested in. And I think that feels like you, a gift for them. And you know that's something that they're going to treasure and remember about this stage in their schooling. Um, I'm not sure if it's particular to grade one, but I do notice that they get good with support at them using metacognition as a skill. And they can, with support, like, explain their thinking and the process of their thought. And this applies across um, all subjects, really. Um, an example would be maybe in maths, that's going to look like explaining how they solve a problem. The focus is on that process as opposed to the answer and the outcome. And for them to notice what they actually did and perhaps even noticing how they are feeling at different stages in this problem, perhaps frustration, perhaps excitement um, when they achieved it. They make 
huge progress as well socially I feel at this age and it's really um awesome to support them in that they can develop the skills for self-regulation and their most emotional intelligence too and they start seeing I think beyond themselves and start seeing the wider classroom school community and wider um out, outside community they become more independent and that's definitely something that we're going to be fostering in the classroom that's going to look um, like them understanding the environment knowing how to take responsibility for their learning selecting the right tools for the activity that they're doing um, outside of class that's going to look like them probably having loads of play dates and they start maybe having sleepovers at this kind of age and they become really um, attached to their friendships and that becomes really important to them and that's something again at this age that we help them navigate because with those strong friendships um, often the conflict arises and they need to learn the strategies and tools to deal with that and how to deal with it themselves. Um, along with those interpersonal skills is a great time for them to collaborate. They really can actually um, work together and see the strengths that individuals bring. Um, and their personal skills and they are able to recognize and name their emotions, which is really powerful in helping them understand themselves and for self-regulation. They can tap into how they're feeling and know what they need to do to support themselves. Um, yeah, I feel like those are the main things. <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted to hear it. Carrie and Anne, in, in highlighting the wide variety of changes uh, progress of students at that age and the difference between them. I think you, you highlighted why we take the approach that we do at TASS, which is to put two qualified, very qualified people in front of a class of 20 or 22, or in some cases fewer, and allow you to focus on the individual child who might need more support in that particular area, or the child who might need more challenge at that particular time in that subject area, or that time of their life. So, Thank you for highlighting that. It explains, I think, our teaching philosophy and why we believe this teacher pairing is going to be an exceptional way for young people to develop. Yeah. Amy, I've got, I've got a couple of questions that I was going to ask. However, if you've got a long queue, I, I could hand over. I, I, I have one more, but I can ask it toward the end. Actually, I have two more. Uh, thank you, Keith. I think you should uh, ask your questions. We don't have uh long queue tonight. We started to have some coming in and then people responded that their question was answered uh, during the, the great answer. So keep forge ahead. All right. I, I, what I'm going to do is give Naomi and Carrie a break for a minute because in a conversation I had over the last few days with our grade three teachers who couldn't be with us tonight, they answered uh, question three for me. So I'm going to read their answer as I remember it. Is the most important thing, I believe, for students is to create significant and meaningful relationships within the classroom environment with everything else goes well. A secure child is a child who is most receptive to learning through positive reinforcement and support in challenging activity. You are building a child's confidence in their abilities. There will be differentiated learning to meet each student where they are. And part of the job of teachers is to observe and recognize individual limits and therefore support learning. The aim is to actively listen to our students and acknowledge their emotions and feelings and give them the space and tools to deal with them. We would model the behavior we want to see and be consistent in our expectations. We would foster each student's natural love for learning by giving them the entire picture through cross-curricular connection. Context builds connections and understanding. By the end of the year spent in grade three, the students would have met curriculum expectations and also be emotionally ready to enter the next grade with readiness and confidence. So that's for any grade three parents who tuned in this evening. All right, we'll get to the next question. How do you encourage creativity, care for others, and teamwork in 
your classroom. And you can pick one of those or all of them. It's entirely up to you. Uh, go ahead, Naomi. Yeah, that's quite a lot. <laughs> um, um, I think going back to maybe what the grade threes were saying as well, I think all those things can flourish, but when there's a safe and caring environment that's been created. So we're going to spend time at the beginning of our academic year, like creating those shared norms and expectations and building that community and setting the tone for collaboration and teamwork. Um, all these things mentioned, a lot of them are skills that can be planned for, they can be taught and experienced in a variety of ways. So I like, we like at this age using stories and books to introduce um, maybe different ideas, but that can be further explored by through role play, us teachers modeling, um, care, persistence and teamwork, of course, in our classroom as well. And bringing awareness to these skills in action, like finding those teachable moments and running with it. I like to, for example, um, often when it comes to skills, running parallel to the learning intention of that lesson, I'd like to maybe highlight a skill that we're also going to be looking at. So uh, I'm trying to think of an example, but uh, say if you're learning about maybe the continents, so there's, that's the knowledge maybe that you're focusing on, but running parallel to that, perhaps the activity is going to require teamwork. So when we're reflecting on our learning at the end, we're looking at the knowledge, but we're also looking maybe at how we, how we um, progress with that skill and what we're going to continue working on. Um, another skill that I think is really important at this age to teach is persistence, like you mentioned, Keith. Um, it really can be taught and practiced, and, and it really isn't enough just to say, be persistent, keep trying. We need to teach what that actually looks like and how to do it. So building strategies that they have when they notice these barriers to learning. They're not just saying, I can't do this and, and giving up. So depending on the student, they might need different strategies. Some might in those moments have maybe negative self-talk and they need to have support developing a growth mindset. That's going to be something that will support them with being persistent and with dealing with challenges that they come across. Um, similarly with teamwork, teamwork was the other one you mentioned, I think. <laughs> um, it can be taught and learning it's important for students to learn about their strengths within a team. What do they bring and perhaps areas that they're going to work on? And then obviously at this age, experimenting with different roles, seeing what it feels like to um, perhaps maybe be like a scribe or recording the team's notes or taking on a leadership role or being somebody maybe managing the resources for the team, looking out for everyone's needs and looking at their own participation within a team. Um, there's so many skills that link to all this, yeah, so then again you're working on their communication skills, their ability to listen and, and it can, they really feed into each other. So they're all skills that, that can be um, taught and definitely will be nurtured like, in the classroom. Thank you, Nancy. I'm going to, I've got an audio problem still. Anyway, I, I was going to allow some of our I see some questions popping up, so I think I won't have Carrie answer this question, maybe later. Um, because you're both so erudite and I blathered on, we're only about, we've only got about 15 minutes left, so let's get to some parent questions. I, I do have the last question uh, for both of you, but we'll ask that a bit later on. So Amy, over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Keith. Um, so a question from uh, Christina, who is a parent of an enrolled first grader. Uh, Christina writes, we live in increasingly complicated and complex times. How will you navigate teaching them about diversity, difference, multiculturalism, and pluralism? Will you teach them conflict resolution skills? Will they be taught to collaborate rather than compete? Naomi, I think you just spoke to that quite a bit. And how will you tackle emotional and physical bullying? So, Amy, I'm going to suggest that I mean, each of those questions, mini questions, is 20 minutes of answer. So I'm going to have Carrie pick whichever piece of that she would like. So there's how do you how do you tackle physical and emotional bullying? How would you navigate diversity and difference? 
Um, how would you teach, teach conflict resolution? Pick on one of those themes, Carrie. And um, excuse me for interrupting, Naomi. I think the feedback's coming from you, so if you can mute when you're not speaking, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, well, picking up on the question of diversity, um, I think that's a really wonderful thing about international schools, that diversity is reflected within the classroom. So children are exposed to diversity on, on a very personal level in, in real life. Um, so we, we naturally will be teaching the children um, in their social and emotional learning all about all kinds of, emotion, of, um, of diversity on a level that is appropriate to them. Um, as Naomi said at the beginning of the year, we'll really spend a lot of time going through um, the way that we're going to nurture positive relationships with one another, the way that it's appropriate to communicate e with each other, um, how we actually establish a respectful classroom culture. So like Naomi said, it's not enough to just say respect one another. We need to really dig into what that means with the children to pick these ideas apart and so that we can come up together with, uh, with guidelines of the ways that we want to treat each other to create a classroom culture that is really, really supportive where all children's needs are reflected and where all learners feel supported. Um, it's really, really important that children feel valued and heard and supported within the classroom environment. That's really the baseline from which everything else comes. So we'll make it an absolute priority to make sure that every child feels supported, listened to and heard in our classrooms. I think that's going to be the, the priority for us, really. Excellent answer, Carrie. Amy, do you have another question to ask or, or should I ask my final question? No, we do have uh, a few more questions. Uh, Keith, in your opinion, did that expand uh, as much as it should on uh, emotional and physical bullying or would you like them to address that more? Well, I asked Carrie to just pick one of them, but if, okay. but if either of them want to make comment on that part of the question, feel free. I guess I've kind of opened up the can. Yeah, so you mean how it would be dealt with exactly? Yes. Like, um, wow, okay, yeah, well, obviously, I'm hoping with the like Carrie was saying about the environment that we've created within the school that there's relationships and we're going to be very aware of what is going on with each student individually. I really hope that then this is going to keep those lines of communication open and we'll be aware of what their experience is. And again, linked to that communication of parents, it's so important. We're getting this whole view of the child's experience um, within the classroom and, and what you're finding out at home. So it's about um, sharing what we know and keeping each other informed and working together on what, what needs to be dealt with. That was great. Thank you, Naomi. Um, you know, I think. Bullying and the experience of bullying is a lived experience, and once you've lived it, it becomes very meaningful. And, and my job is, as headmaster of the school, I think, is to bully the faculty so they know what it feels like to be bullied, and then they can transmit the learning experience. Not kidding, of course. Uh, what's the next question, Amy? Uh, the next question is from uh, the mother of an enrolled first grader, uh, and Alex is interested uh, in knowing if there are coding and robotics classes in first grade. And I can answer that, I guess, it's that they certainly are. And coding is, is integrated into our curriculum from preschool all the way through middle school. So I think um, regardless of the grade, that answer is a yes. We have a teacher uh, who you may have met. I think John Iglar was one of our early participants on Coffee with Keith, maybe our first. And John talked about his approach to coding with the young children in grade one and before that. And uh, John is an expert in working with kids of all ages and has done for many, many years. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. Uh, how, talk about um, how you encourage students in the habit of reading, how you help develop that habit in them. I think, um, sorry. 
Try it again. You go ahead, Carrie, because oh, Matt is no, muted. Sorry. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll go ahead then. Um, so I think uh, to begin with, it's really important to, to lead by example. So if children see the adults around them and their friends, if they're in an environment that is text rich, and if they see that the people around them are reading, they're going to see that that is something that they really want to do. So they're going to feed off of the enthusiasm of the people around them. Um, I think it's also really important to give children access to literature in as many different forms as possible. So it might be that one particular child would really enjoy reading fiction and storybooks and another child might be more interested in non-fiction. Um, it's also really important that children feel a sense of purpose for their reading. So maybe reading instructions or guidelines for something, something that they feel is relevant to their lives. So it doesn't seem like this pointless thing that they're doing for no reason, but that they can see that the, there's really a purpose to reading. Um, it's also important, I think, to be very encouraging, very supportive, but not pushy with it, because we want children to love reading. We want them to develop a real love of literature and for them to feel a sense of ownership over it. So I think exposing children to text, however that might be. So maybe it's sharing a story if the child isn't actually reading yet. Um, that's really, really important and really valuable too, because we want reading to be something that children feel enthusiastic about, not something that is like, oh, I have to go and read. So I think a little bit every now and then, if you're reading with a child, maybe they read a few words on the page or maybe they don't read. Maybe you just share the story together and then you talk about it and you play games based around it. Um, so I really think it's important to um, keep reading purposeful and keep reading fun and try and resist the urge not to be too pushy with it because if children feel a love for reading and they feel that they want to learn to read they will learn to read they, they may not learn to read quicker than anyone else in their class but they will learn to read it will come if they feel this enthusiasm and this desire to begin reading so I think that's the most important thing that is really really precious that we need to try to hold on to Yeah, I totally agree with Carrie as well. Like their self-esteem, like it's really important to keep that up. And I think what you were talking about is like positive reading experiences. It needs to be associated as a pleasurable, like positive thing in their lives. And obviously children might have different feelings about readings at different times. And again, as if we're communicating about that, we can find strategies and find ways in for them, ways that are going to excite them about reading. Maybe it's just they haven't found the right type of book for them at the moment. We, that is something that is going to be a priority for us, nurturing that love of reading. So we're going to be doing everything we can to foster that. Thank you both. And I know you, you both endorse reading aloud at this age. And, and yes. I've written a blog on that. And I know we've talked about that. So. Um, here's the last question that I have, and you must answer it in less than 30 seconds. Sorry, <laughs> if there's one thing your students will remember about you when they are older, it is... Um, okay, well, I'll go first, um, but I'll try not to... Um... Yeah, take longer than 30 seconds. I have, a, as Naomi knows, I actually have a story behind this, so I'll have to cut that. Um, so it's really, You've sorry. got 45 seconds, go ahead. <laughs> it's really um, that I had faith in them, that I believed in them. Um, I had a teacher who had faith in me and really believed in me in a way that seemed like something very, very minor, something unimportant that I'm sure he wouldn't remember. He showed faith in me and he told me he believed in me at a moment when I was feeling really nervous. And it meant a huge amount to feel that acknowledgement, to feel seen and respected in a way. And um, it really nurtured a great relationship between me and that teacher. And so I really felt the power of someone believing in you, someone genuinely believing you, in you is a, is a really powerful thing. Excellent. 37 seconds. Go ahead, Naomi. 
Um, I'll keep it simple. I, I believe that they will remember me as being a very kind teacher. Um, I will always see the best in them and see them for who they are and encourage them. And so I think apart from maybe remembering what I was like, I think they will definitely remember how they felt at this age and how they felt coming through grade one. It will be a very positive experience for them. Um. <laughs> Perfect. I think at this point, I'm going to say thank you to Naomi, who's in Thailand. You, you did a brilliant job, Naomi, and you've thank earned you. your best. Yes, and thank you. I'm awake okay. now. <laughs> Sorry about that. I know you're packing to leave and join us shortly. And of course, to Carrie yeah. Norman, who's in Sintra and close by. Uh, you both did a very admirable job. I think uh, it was 10 years ago when we introduced our other grade one teachers, Heather and Aaron. And I know they're listening in because Heather made a comment that she's so excited to be working with this team. Uh, hi. Of, um, you know, I'm going to get you to mute. I'm not sure if it's my computer or that might be better. The, the people who saw our first two grade one teachers 10 months, uh, ten weeks ago, Heather and Aaron, I think many of the parents and students probably fell in love and maybe fell in love too early. And now they're thinking, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> two teachers are also exceptional. Now I'm having second thoughts, which ones would be better? So, you know, I'm not trying to create a competition. And I'm, in fact, obviously I'm just joking. You two were fantastic. It's going to be an amazing team to have the four of you working together side by side in two classrooms. And we can't wait for you to arrive. So thank you both. Yeah, it's a pleasure. We're really excited too. Yeah, very excited. Thank you. Thank you. And, and also to Sam, Mason and Carl Slater. I know you're watching. Uh, we miss you tonight, but we'll see you very soon. I've said this repeatedly for 13 weeks. We have the finest group of teachers assembled. Your, your children are in for a treat. And if you find a better elementary program taught by better teachers than we have, I will pay your tuition at that school. That was just a test to see if you were awake, and that was a joke. However, I'm not worried that anyone will be challenging that anytime soon. So uh, in closing, we've got a couple minutes. This will be the last time you hear from me, at least for a bit. And I want to thank everyone who's here tonight and who's participated over the last three plus months for uh, indulging me, for tolerating my sense of humor, and occasionally my ethical diatribes. I will say I've met virtually every parent and the young people who will join this community in a few short months. And I believe they are very good people who want a more equitable and just world, who care about the planet, and about those who have had the misfortune not to be born in a civilized society or a democratic one or a safe one or did not have the economic opportunity to enjoy the life we have. My mother taught me by example that hard work is good. Taking pride in your work is noble. Exercise is a necessity for health. But caring for others is the only path to eternal life. She's a much better person than I am but I'm trying to be a little bit better every day. And our goal here, so everyone is clear, is to help create a school that does a few things very well. A school that creates an inclusive, supporting, a supportive, respectful, and ethical community of teachers, students, and parents. A school that educates young people to understand the world in which they live and their place in it and helps them to strive for something other than solely financial success, but instead to find something really meaningful to chase. And when they catch it, to have the courage to confront it and hopefully improve it. We're not just here to create another school. We're here to create a great school. And I want to thank the families who believed in our vision and who have enrolled their most precious assets with us, your children, and who will join us as founding families because together, we will create an amazing community of learners. And yes, you are helping us to found 
this school and we need your support to create the school that your children deserve. And we promise to educate your children to the highest standard while supporting their full growth and development and importantly, to do it hand in hand with you, their parents and our partners. I have no doubt this will be the best school and that you will help us make it so. We've gone one minute over time, but we started one minute late. It's been my true pleasure to spend the last 13 weeks with you. You cannot imagine the excitement that we all share to see all of you in person shortly and to welcome you to this fantastic school that you will be part of. So please take good care, enjoy your summer and stay safe. We'll see you in 10 weeks, if not sooner. Good night, everyone.